Let me invite you to grab your coffee and uh, slip out now if you don't want to listen, or come on up and join us as, as, you're, uh, as you're able. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons I mentioned the coffee is uh, tomorrow I have a medical procedure that at 10.15 today, I have to stop having anything with caffeine in it, and I am downloading my coffee now. <laughs> so if we stop a little early, it's so I can get another cup of coffee before I have to stop for 24 hours. Uh, it's not, not that uh, Starbucks and I have this relationship that's going on, but it's, it's the truth of my life in many ways. So uh, it, kinda, it sort of runs on coffee. So good to be with you this morning. I'm Don Johnson, and uh, uh, hard to believe, I, God willing, thanks. Amy does good work. Hey, just get some straws or a, a drip. We could just have a, just a caffeine drip would be, would be a wonderful thing. Um, but uh, uh, I'm glad to be back here with you again. Uh, I would, had someone mentioned that they had remembered what I talked about last time, which, number one, that startled me. Uh, secondly, uh, they, they, but in some detail, I was talking about uh, some of the uh, work that I've been uh, doing in terms of, of uh, working with an analyst, a Jungian analyst. And I have, since I was here last time, I have entered actively into a, a, an analytical relationship with a a uh, fellow down in, in uh, Water Valley, Mississippi, which I describe as 91 miles and 50 years ago from where I live. It's a, it's a different world in Water Valley. It's a great place, great place to be, and this analyst, Ben Toole, is just a terrific guy. And um, so I go down there literally every week to, to spend an hour uh, with him. And uh, it, it has been helpful for me at, at uh, kind of this stage in my life, and, and, and I've... I've uh, uh, found that it's let me kind of put some things in some perspective that, that probably earlier on, I, back when I first was introduced to, to the writings of Carl Jung, I was in my 20s, and so I, underst- I memorized a lot of definitions, but I had no clue what they meant, you know? And so, uh, so over time, that has become uh, a, a point of reference for me now, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just finding it helpful. So it, it always kind of comes up in some form or fashion when I'm uh, sharing uh, in, in, in teaching in any, in any setting. Uh, what I want to start with today is about the importance of names. Uh, my name is Don Edward Johnson. Um, the reason for that is complex. Uh, it is at least in part because my father hated his name. My father's name was Eldridge Ewing Johnson, and it just never worked for him. And some of you, I've, I've actually shared this with some folks before, but uh, he really didn't like his name. And my dad was a golf professional. And so what he did one time when he was probably in his 50s, he was in Nashville, uh, club pro at Bell Mead, and where we'd been for like 18 years. And while, while he was there, he decided he was going to take a group of men on a golfing trip to play the old St. Andrews course in Scotland. And he did not have, hi Gene, nice to see you, good morning. Uh, he did not have uh, uh, a, uh, a passport. So he had to go get a passport, but to get a passport he had to have a birth certificate. So he had to go get his birth certificate. For, and so he went back to St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville. And he went back there and he said, uh, uh, May 31st, 1919, Okay, uh, and uh, it's uh, Eldridge Ewing Johnson. So they're going through the files. We don't have an Eldridge Ewing Johnson. So we've got to. I'm here, obviously, you know. No, we don't have one. But we do have a Charles Clifton Johnson who was born that day. And Dad said, you know, that might be the problem because Charles Clifton was his father's name. And his parents had decided while he was in the hospital that they were going to name him Charles Clifton Johnson, Jr. Okay? So sometime between the time they filled out the paperwork and they left the hospital, they changed their minds. So he went through his entire life as Eldridge Ewing Johnson, which was a name he didn't like. And in order to get the passport to go to Scotland... It was less expensive and a lot less hassle for him to pay $50 to have his name legally changed to the name he didn't like so that he could officially become who he wasn't. (laughs) He finally, he actually had to take on that name. Well, the reason I go into this rambling story is he said to my mother, Fonda, 
I'm going to name him the shortest name I can think of. So it's not Donald, it's Don, and I'm glad he stopped thinking at that point because it could have gotten shorter. I don't know what it might have ended up being, but names have interesting histories, and the middle name is after my father's older brother. Names are important, and they have power, and certainly certainly in Scripture we find that, that names have power as well, and you could go through, I can give some examples of it, but just to kind of, kind of lift up that, that idea for you, I have... Uh, uh, it, and it's not just that they, that they have power as a name, and it's not just people's names, but um, they're, they're, they're a power, there's a power that can, doesn't have to, but can be associated with a person's position, a person's profession. Uh, some people respond to the word doctor in one way and some in a different way. Uh, the fact I'm going in for, uh, you know, a procedure tomorrow, I think more about doctor in a different way than I might just in the abstract. I'm thinking about a particular doctor in a particular way of doing things, okay? So, uh, you know, it, it, these words are, are important in the sense that they can have definition, but in addition to definition, they can have an emotive quality about them that really gives them energy in our lives at a conscious or unconscious level. Now, I promised Mike I was going to do this before he had to slip out and go sing. Um, so I'm going to teach you. You might already know this song, but I, I want to teach it to you. Uh, and and uh, it, it is Agnes Day. Anyone know what that means? Good, Sandy. I'm glad you do. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm encouraged. That's, that's, that's very helpful. Okay, but it's a Lamb of God. So I'm going to sing it, and then you sing it back. And this is a... This is a, a, a uh, setting for this that I learned at the house of, last House of Bishops meeting, uh, we sang this. I think we've done it a couple of times before that. O Lamb of God, O Lamb of God, you take away, you take away the sin of the world, the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lamb of God. Grant us your peace. Nice. Y'all did much better at it than I did. I pitched it about three octaves higher than I can sing, but it, we made it, you know, we made it through. So, um, now, Lamb of God, okay, this is going to be one of the readings that we'll hear about today from, from Revelation. We've been, been doing a lot of work in Revelation, and the language there, the names, the images and all, great power to them. Last week, really uh, one of those powerful moments in, in, in the Revelation where the Lamb of God, who is the Christ, Jesus, okay, enthroned, or about to be enthroned, approaches the throne of God and takes from the hand of the one who is seated on the throne a seal, a scroll that is sealed with seven seals, okay? okay? And receiving that, then that sets in motion everything else that takes place in the revelation because as the seals are broken, there's another judgment and another change that takes place in the world. Okay. That's, and so the revelation to John is, in fact, a, a story. It is a revelation. It is, if you will, a living, waking dream that John the, the revelator has that tells his encounter with God and how that, for him, became a way of understanding the way God is working in the world. So the Lamb of God is a very rich image. It's a strange image, you know, because Jesus as the Lamb, or, or the Christ as the Lamb, the Messiah as the Lamb, is the sacrifice. But also, by becoming the sacrifice, is the one who, in fact, saves the world. I mean, it's an interesting kind of double-edged thing. It's, it's like the, the, the Lamb is sacrificed, and yet the sacrifice is, in fact, the very one that is the Savior of the world. It's a rich, rich thing. It's got an emotive quality about it that's more than just the definition of a lamb. But also, this Sunday is called Good Shepherd Sunday. And so every time we're in this middle of the Easter season, we're always dealing with the lamb imagery at this time of year. And we're always dealing with the shepherd 
imagery. Uh, I showed at 8 o'clock the, the shepherd's crook that the bishop carries, the crozier. And, you know, and we kid about it, but there is a truth in it that the role of the shepherd and Jesus is, as the good shepherd is to lead the flock, to gather the flock, to move the flock along. That's the reason there are two ends to the crozier. One is to pull you back if you get in trouble. The other is to poke us along if, we, if we're not moving fast enough. Okay? So, so there's that kind of quality about being uh, in relationship to Jesus, who is both the good shepherd and, interestingly enough, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, that is a, a way of, of, of giving us a richness of imagery to try to understand what it is God is saying to you in your life through these Bible passages. Well, that's one piece of it. The Bible is obviously a place that the message of God is recorded for us, but the Bible's not the only place that it's recorded. We look around and we look at our own histories. We talked about our family names, but we look around and we look at, to all of the different influences, the memories, dreams, and reflect, reflections, to use Jungian kind of language, that have come together to form us. And then we go to the Bible and we see these images, and they take on particular meaning for you. Now, they have a general meaning, but they take on a particular meaning for you. Now, in community, we look for ways to say, well, that's, that's a big enough image that we all share. Lamb of God, good shepherd. And we think that we all mean the same thing by that. But you might respond to that language in a very different way. As I said, your encounter with your doctor may be one thing. When I use the word mother or father for you, that might be a very different emotional tone for you to respond to than the way I might do that. Appropriately so. It's your encounter with those images that live inside you. Okay? So one of the things that's a challenge to the church is if we now live in a world, and I think we do, that is no longer willing to accept one definition of right and wrong, one definition of good and bad, one definition of in and out, one definition of black and white, we now live in a world that says we have more responsibility to address that emotional tone within us as we encounter all those parts of ourselves that bubble up as we try to live together. It's a challenge, it's a challenge to do. It doesn't mean that we can't believe anything. In fact, we believe, we believe religiously. We believe fervently in what we believe. But when we do that, I think we also have to, to say, but I may be wrong, or that may not be the whole truth. I think that's one of the things the Episcopal Church does rather well. You know? We tend to hold these polarities in tension in a way that some other religions, and they all have their gifts and strengths about them, but some other religious expressions will, will say, well, this is the answer. Okay. And if that's the answer, there's no debate about it. Okay. So what we end up doing is deforming, if you will, ourselves to try to fit the answer. Whereas, in fact, our lives are much richer and more complex than that quite often. And we need, at times, answers enough to work day to day and make some reasonable assumptions about what the next thing it is we are to do. But you might find, as you encounter for yourself those images that bubble up out of Scripture, and some of them are sort of strange, as they bubble up out of Scripture or as you encounter those images of the good person in your life, or the bad person in your life, that in fact, that's really tr closer to the truth. They're, it's more complex than simple. Not everybody is interested in being involved with a religious denomination that has as many questions as it does answers. But within the Episcopal Church, we have, we have the sense that God is in fact speaking through us in a particular way, in a particular way. And I think that certain themes in the Episcopal Church get lifted up as being important. The notion of mercy, the notion of inclusion, the notion of caring in a way that seems antithetical. It's not only seems antithetical, it is antithetical to some other denominations or to some other religious uh, persuasions of the understanding of how God works in the world. So we, we're living in a kind of a tension right now. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it says we don't have the whole truth, but we do have an insight. And we do have a way of going together as a people, 
as Episcopalians to look at how God's working in the world. But I want to push it back out to you to say, but in the end, you're going to have to decide that within yourself because you have voices within you. You have presence within you that is going to inform the right, the wrong, the good, the bad, the best, the better, the possible, all the different ways you might respond in life. You're invited to do that for yourself. In the end, you're going to have to make that decision. But by walking with friends, as we do here, okay, we also are beginning to learn a common language and an emotional language so that as we learn about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we learn about God. Because what we know about God, we basically know from looking at Jesus as Christians. That's what, at least what we teach. So that's, that's what I know about God. Well, that's the way Jesus did it. Here we are in the Easter season, and I'll say this again today in a different setting in the sermon, but it, in, in the Easter season, what we end up doing is becoming those who follow Christ and try to live our lives in a way that reflect that same kind of understanding of what it means to be sent by God into the world. I mean, you and I are sent people. If our lives have not been changed by our encounter with God, we've not been paying attention the question is not whether or not God is engaged in us. Otherwise, if we were not engaged with God and in God, even in this very moment, we wouldn't be here. But because we're engaged with God, God is trying to say something to you and to me. And it might be a different word to you and to you and to you and to me. In fact, it is. But God is trying to speak to us. And the question is not whether or not we're engaged with God, but what has the encounter with God that you and I have, are having right now what has it done to change the way we live our lives? How is our life being changed as we encounter the big name of God, which talk about a name that has power, changes all of us in the world? I'm watching. Okay. How can it change us in the world? How can it change us in the world? I want to make sure I understand. Um, how can it change us in the world, or how does it change the world? It's a good question. If I walk through the world, as I am right now, and I walk out into the street, and as I walk across the street, I'm aware that there is a bus coming at me, but I determine that it is more important for me to keep walking than to pay attention to the bus, I get run over and I get killed. Okay? If, however, I get the sense as I'm about to step in the street that somewhere along the line I've been taught that if I step in front of a bus, I'm going to get run over. Then in fact, I make a change in the way I'm behaving, and so much of who I am is the way I behave. I make a change in the way I behave, so I stop and let the bus go by, and I continue living unscathed by that. Now, it's not a great and brilliant answer to your better question. But I think that there is a reality that the choices we make, the behaviors that we have, have consequences in the world. And when they have consequences in the world, for better or worse, the world gets changed just as much as we do by that. Our world changes based on decisions we make. I hope that's helpful, Emma. But thank you for jumping in. I wrote a poem back in the 1970s. Again, interestingly enough, it was about, uh, about the time that I was oh, still, still studying a good deal, there it is, of the, uh, of the writings of, of Carl Jung, but, but I was more engaged at that time in a world of symbols that was, that was related more to the church and my life in the church. Uh, when I went to seminary, I had grown up in the Baptist church over in Nashville. And the Baptist church focused a great deal on words and on literal meaning of words. Okay? And I'm particularly appreciative of that exposure to scripture that I had back then because I can find my way around the Bible. But having said that, I began to find that the words weren't working for me anymore, 
or some of the answers I was given weren't working for me in, anymore in the way they had when I was growing up in that tradition. It's not to take away from that at all, I'm, for which I'm very thankful. Okay? But for me, I was changing. I was changing. So the, my world was changing around me. When I went to seminary, I went to a, 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 a seminary that was a common, it was called Seabury Western. It's, it was in Chicago. And the, 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 it was a combination of two seminaries. One was evangelical and the other was Anglo-Catholic. Putting those together became kind of emblematic or symbolic of my life. I think it's, it's what has happened. And as I entered the Episcopal Church, I didn't know anything about our worship. That was a new world to me. And it truly was a world of symbols. And as such, it was, that doesn't mean it wasn't true. In fact, it was powerful because the symbols were so transparent. You know, I mean, it could be as simple as what I used to do in a confirmation class where I would ask the people, now I want you to just draw for me, okay, draw a picture top down of the church you went to when you were a kid. What do you think of when you think of, okay, so you, you draw that and you look down and you say, where, where do you put the altar and where's the font and where do the people and, 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 and uh, uh, where's the word proclaimed? Okay. Where do you put all those pieces? And it says a lot about our understanding of how we're taught by our structures, by what surrounds us, about what's important. Or if you will, where is God in this picture? You know, when I grew up in the Baptist church, right in the center was what? The pulpit. That's right. The Word of God was front and center. And where was the altar? If they had it at all, and it was a memorial table. And the font was not a font, it was a pool. You know? It was all behind me. It was right, it was right behind where the, pul- where the pulpit was. Okay? So if that imagery teaches us something about what's important. In the Episcopal Church, what's in the middle? Okay. Okay. And what does the altar symbolize for us? Communion. Gift of God, forgiveness, sacrifice, family dinner table. So that's perfect. See, because what you've just done is to talk about the emotional energy that's around one word, altar. Okay? It means different things to different people, and it's how you emphasize that in terms of, of what, what the church is teaching you and what you're learning and what you're attending to when we gather together for worship. Okay? All right. And you hit, you hit the key notes there. because you know, It is a table. It is a place of sacrifice. It is, in fact, reminiscent of the early martyrs who went into the catacombs to worship because they would be persecuted if they worshiped publicly, so they had to go hide to worship. So it's a rich, rich image, just like cross or good shepherd. It has a lot more there. There's more there than it appears to be along the way. I keep looking at my watch, both because I need to know the time and have some more coffee. So So I wrote this poem out of my Anglo-Catholic experience. It was one of the things I wrote when I was doing my, my doctor of ministry work, and it was around the whole symbolism of the church. And um, well, I'll just put it out there for what it is. It, it, it doesn't necessarily need response to it, but, but it, 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 it says something about a journey that I've been on a long time, and the longer I am on this journey, the more this makes sense to me. And there's so many things I do that that's not the case. <laughs> the longer I'm doing that, the more I'm confused. But this, this seems to be crystallizing in my life, right? Come with me to the mystery of depth and plane and height. Come with me to the mystery that dwells in light and night. No visionary lamps have I, no rights to right what's wrong. And yet I know the mystery, its rhythm and its song. This song which breaks our silent wish to capture it in stone. This song held close as if to feel we were not left alone. 
But stones for bread I will not give, nor simply what is known. Come to me, come with me to the mystery, or go there on your own. For mystery of depth and plain, and mystery of heights afar, cannot be reached by going there, but being where you are. What's changing in my life is an awareness that being where I am right now is the most important thing I can do. I've spent so much of my life, I don't know about you, but I've spent so much of my life being preoccupied, preoccupied to be somewhere else than where I am. God is with us in this moment, as well as into the future, as well as out of the past. But being where we are is the most alive place we can be. That's now. It's the only place to be. All the rest is memory. All that lies ahead is hope. But being where we are right now is the gift of God today. When we gather in here with 32 people who are coming forward to be confirmed today, 32 people, number one, you have to feel good about that. You know, it's a great sign of, of the positive things going on here. In addition to that, it's one of those things that, that remind me that you and I will be the influence for these people that will change their experience of what it means to be followers of Christ. And when you and I carry the stuff that's inside of us already to that relationship, it's a holy, holy responsibility. It's not something to fear, but it is something to be mindful of because we go to be with these people in such a way that we are companions in the way. All I want to do is just invite us to enjoy that challenge and that opportunity to love them with the love of Christ. Because as I said at the beginning, this is about not just looking at Jesus, who is the great shepherd, but about you and I becoming those under shepherds today for those that we'll be walking alongside with even now, even now. So let's, we'll end with this. It's a few minutes early, but I'm going to go up and meet with, with the confirmants. Uh, we'll do the short version. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Thank you for the time this morning. Good to be with you, and um, I'm going to slip out. Just give you a chance to have some coffee. I'll probably get one more, and uh, and I'll see you in church. Uh, look forward to it. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.